I'm in Nordheimer Ravine, and this thing behind me is an emergency exit for the subway system. It was used to evacuate survivors in a deadly subway crash, the Russell Hill accident. Let's find out more. I'm releasing this video on August the 11th, 2025, the 30th anniversary of this crash. A southbound subway train heading from St. Clair West to DuPont plowed into the rear of the train in front of it that was stopped in the tunnels between the stations. Three people died and dozens more were injured. What happened? Well, to understand that, you need to know something about the TTC's signaling system. Now, if you're using this as a cheat sheet for a TTC subway operator's exam, this is not the video you're looking for. First off, the signaling system has changed. This is line one, which now uses a completely different and much more modern system. But even on lines two and four, the system has been modified from the way it used to be at the time of this crash. Also, I'm only going to talk about the things you need to know to understand the crash. So, let's dig in. The subway used what's called a fixed block system. The layout is divided into segments called blocks. Unlike my illustration, they're not all the same length in real life. There's a signal guarding the entrance to each block. If any part of a train is anywhere in a block, the entire block is considered to be occupied. If there is no part of a train in the block, the block is clear. It's somewhat inefficient as it keeps trains farther apart than may strictly be necessary, which is why Line 1 now uses a better system that keeps track of each train's precise position and speed. But remember that Toronto's subway system was designed in the 1940s, and the simplicity of a fixed block system fit the technology of the day. The simplest type of signal has the three colored lights you'd expect if you drive a car. Red means exactly what you think. In the famous words of Gandalf, you shall not pass. Yellow means that the next light is red, so you can enter the block, but you need to be prepared to stop at the next light. And green means good to go. Some signals have two sets of colored lights. In those signals, the top light has the same meaning as what I just described, while the bottom light gives the driver additional information, such as which way a switch is set ahead of the train. We don't need more detail on that, you just need to know that on those lights there are always two colors illuminated. Also, some signals have a white light below the colored lights. This is called a lunar aspect. Aspect is a railroading term that refers to the appearance of a signal that conveys some sort of meaning. That's used to indicate a section where something called grade timing is used to enforce a speed limit, either in a downhill section where gravity would tend to make the train speed up, or in sharp curves. Grade timing is key to understanding what went wrong in this crash, so let's talk some more about that. If grade timing is in effect in a block, the light at the far end of the block will be red. When the train enters the block, the signal system starts a timer that will change the red signal at the right time. For instance, if it would take the train 20 seconds to drive through the block at the speed limit, the signal will be red for 20 seconds and will then change to either yellow or green. And because the signal at the end of the block is red, the signal at the start of the block must be yellow, because yellow means that the next light is red. It's quite common to have multiple grade timing blocks in a row, as was the case where this crash happened. But in a section with grade timing, there are two reasons why a signal could be yellow or red. Either there's a train ahead and the driver may need to stop, or the track is clear and the driver is okay to proceed as long as they obey the speed limit. The driver needs to know the difference, and that's where the lunar aspect, that white light under the colored signals, comes into play. If the lunar aspect is lit on the signal at the start of a block, that means grade timing is in effect and is making the signals more restrictive than they would otherwise be. If it's not lit, that means that the reason for the red or yellow signal is that there's a train ahead. If you're like me, you may have enjoyed sitting in the rail fan seat at the front of the subway, watching as the train goes down the tracks and seeing all the tracks and tunnels and signals go by. And if you're of a certain age, you might have noticed that up, up until about 30 years ago, the drivers would often just charge up to red lights without stopping or slowing down 
Sometimes you would see the red light change just before the train went past, and sometimes you wouldn't. But the drivers assumed they could just run right at the speed limit and the light would change as the train went past it. This driver was no exception, and management was pretty casual about letting the drivers get away with it. Let's take a ride through that section of track today while we talk about what happened. Now remember, the signaling system is different, so you're not going to see the signals that I'm talking about but the track in the tunnel is still the same. You'll see some signs on the right side of the tunnel with numbers. Those are speed limits. As you will see, there are sharp curves. What you can't see as easily is the elevation change of somewhere around 30 meters from St. Clair West down to DuPont. Because of the curves and slope, this section used grade timing. At the start of this section, there was one of those signals with two sets of colored lights and a white light below. When the driver left St. Clair West, it showed yellow over green without the white light, meaning that the next light was red because there was another train ahead. But he said he thought it was yellow over white, which is actually not possible for that signal. But that would have meant that the next light was red only because of grade timing. He thought he could run this section at the speed limit and the next signal would clear just as he passed it, and the same thing for the next few signals since this was a long section with multiple grade timing blocks in a row. But in reality there was a train stopped on the tracks ahead, part way to DuPont, and none of the signals had their lunar aspect lit. The driver couldn't see the train ahead because of the curves in the track. When he came around the curve and saw the train ahead, he braked, but it was too late to stop. His train hit the one before it at about 50 kilometers an hour. Now, there's a failsafe that's supposed to stop the train if the driver runs a red light. Next to the tracks, beside each signal, is a trip arm. If the signal is red, the trip arm is raised, and if the signal is anything other than red, the trip arm is lowered. And if you watch this footage closely, you'll notice that the trip arm lowers at about the same time that the signal switches from red. There is a lever located on each subway car, positioned so that if the trip arm is raised, it will strike the lever and that trips the train's emergency brakes. So, why didn't that work? Well, the contractor installing the signaling system on this section of the line, the Spadina extension, decided to use a trip arm other than the one that was specified. Now, they modified it and they figured it should work with the existing system, but using the wrong trip arm turned out to be a fatal flaw. Over time, with use, the rails and the wheels get worn. As I mentioned in my video on restricted speed zones, there's a magic link up here, and I'll put a link down in the description so you can find it when you finished watching this video. Also, as the train goes around corners, it rides up on the outer rail and it rides down on the inner rail. The combination of all of this means that the position of that lever relative to the trip arm that's mounted to the floor of the tunnel can change. And it changed just enough that it didn't work in this case. In fact, the trip arm, instead of hitting the lever, hit a piece of the train just in front of the lever. That knocked the trip arm down, and by the time the trip arm raised back up, the lever had passed over it, and the emergency brakes were not activated. This accident killed three passengers and injured dozens more passengers and train operators. Of course, an inquest was held to find out why it happened and figure out how to prevent it from happening again. The TTC came up with a list of 236 things to improve. I'll just mention a few. Obviously, the trip arm problem had to be fixed, and it was. The TTC also cracked down on drivers who ran red lights. That behavior had been tolerated by management, but after the crash, they started suspending drivers who did it repeatedly. They got more serious about maintenance so that wear and tear would be addressed more promptly, and fixed procedural issues that sometimes interfered with communication and tracking of defects between the workers at track level and the engineers back in the office. This driver was new, on his second day of work after 12 days of training. Driver training was increased to several weeks, with mandatory refresher courses every couple of years. They also changed how the grade timing signals work. 
At the time, the only indication of grade timing was the lunar aspect at the start of the block. Once the driver was past that, there was nothing to show whether the next signal was red due to grade timing or a train ahead. The driver just had to remember it. The system was changed so that once the train had entered a block where grade timing was in effect, the top red light on the next signal would start flashing. So now the driver can tell. If the red light is flashing, it's grade timing. If it's not flashing, you have to stop. Ultimately, the TTC got complacent about safety again, and in 2023, a derailment, thankfully not fatal, brought about the sudden end of Line 3, the Scarborough RT. And there are some parallels to what happened in the Russell Hill crash. The vehicles for Line 3 use linear induction motors, one part of which is a strip of metal that's mounted between the tracks. That interacts with a, an electromagnetic field generated by electromagnets on the bottom of the cars. In order for that to work efficiently, the gap between the electromagnets and the strip needs to be fairly small. There's a certain level of tolerance there, but it typically aims at about one centimeter. Remember that number. The electromagnetic field doesn't just propel the train back and forth, it also has a side effect of pulling up on that strip. So it needs to be firmly bolted down to the track bed. The TTC had workers walk the tracks frequently, looking for and noting problems. But they weren't always well trained, a lot of them were junior staff who didn't have much experience inspecting the track, and there were some deficiencies in the system that the TTC used to track and manage the defects that were reported. In fact, just a couple of weeks before the crash, at that very location, the workers walking the track noted some failed bolts, the strip was pulled up about a centimeter, and it had scuff marks on it, showing that it had made contact with some of the cars passing over it. Yet, when it was entered into the system, it was marked as the lowest priority, and it had not been fixed by the time of the accident. Now, I mentioned the bolts. It's only natural that these things wear out and have to be replaced over time. That's normal. But instead of replacing them with the original bolts or something that met the specifications of the original bolts, the TTC decided to use different bolts that didn't meet the specifications and weren't even the right size. So the TTC modified them so that they would fit. It's that same kind of, eh, it'll do attitude that was involved in the trip arms in this accident. And it turned out that these replacement bolts had a tendency to fail. On the day of the accident, as the train passed over, as the final car on the train went over, the strip was pulled up enough that it struck the car and caused it to derail. In the investigation into the aftermath of this, there were a number of places throughout the system where it was discovered that bolts had failed, the strip had been pulled up and had scuff marks on it, and a number of the cars also had scuff marks on the bottom, showing that on a number of occasions, the cars and the metal strip had made contact, just not enough to cause a derailment until the day that it did. Well, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, you know what to do. Please like and subscribe.